Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I just want to congratulate all the BRAC students for putting together a great program in a difficult time. So my name is Betsy Toll, and I'm a primary care doctor uh, working in the MedPeds clinic um, over at Rhode Island Hospital. And I've been involved with affidavits for a few years now, and we'll try to share some of the lessons I've learned as we move through these slides. So our goals are to understand the purpose and the role of written testimony, to figure out the components of a forensic evaluation as described by the Istanbul Protocol, to explain best practices for including specifics and findings in your report, and what should be left out of a forensic report. We'll also talk about the importance of testimony in immigration court and identify aspects of successful testimony preparation and of the testimony itself. So affidavits and our sworn statements. This is written testimony that's submitted as evidence. Now there's a difference between an affidavit and a sworn statement. Obviously both require you to swear to the truth of what you're saying, but with an affidavit, your identity is separate separately verified by a notary, although this practice varies between courts and agencies, so you should check with your attorney. I have never needed to go to a notary, although that the, the lawyer's office may actually be a notary. At trial, you may be asked to testify in support of what you've written, and a written statement is presumably more reliable when the testimony stands up to cross-examination in a court setting. So as you're preparing an affidavit, it's important always to ask yourself, do I feel comfortable testifying and defending the language or the content of what I've written? So the basic structure of an affidavit is initially to tell in an introduction the credentials of the evaluator, and this part is written by the evaluator. What was your training? What are your credentials? What are the things that you've done professionally that leads you to be a person who could be a legitimate affidavit writer? And then the evaluation details, including what data took place, in what setting, and the names of those present. And I actually have people sign in on a sheet that I include with the affidavit. Then there's the client narrative. This is the story that is told by the client and enlisted by the evaluator during the course of the evaluation. And this is written by the medical student scribes. This includes information about the client's history, background, and the circumstances that led this person to seek asylum and their current life situation in the United States. It is a narrative structure. It is not clinical criteria unless the client discusses something about their mental or physical health. You don't assess during the narrative. You're not saying, I think this must be this diagnosis because the client is saying this and no medical opinion. So this is the story as it appears and as you midwife it from the client. So um, just wanted to lighten things up a little bit. This is a book that we have in our office, Global Baby. So we'll be looking at some cute kids that we hope will never need to have affidavits. So here's my CV on the left, and I go through and I put in yellow things from my background that make me qualified to evaluate. Um, and here's an example of the relevant history. So um, we just go back, go through, and um, I said on January 8th this year, I conducted this evaluation at the Clinica Esperanza. Um, before that, I reviewed a written statement that I'd received from the lawyer. Um, this is a 16-year-old woman in her early childhood. According to her, the village was typically this way, and so on. Now, you'll notice we are not entering a short story contest here. Um, this is written in terse paragraphs by content or idea or chronology, and we usually number or letter them just like this. Please think about your, the judge who's reading this as an elderly person with very thick reading glasses who's tired reading this late at night. Make it easy. 
make those paragraphs reasonable chunks of text, leave big margins, white space, so that it's possible to move through it. It's not just a giant chunk of text. The basic structure of the affidavit is to do, uh, after the narrative, to write the physical exam findings or the psychiatric assessment um, as uh, found by the evaluator. Um, that would include physical exam findings. And I will generally include a full physical exam written in clear lay language um, and including any findings that may result to, to injuries or scars on the, on the client's body. Um, the results of any diagnostic evaluations or criteria used. So for example, if you do a mental health screen like the PHQ-9 or anxiety screen or a trauma screen, um, and the criteria that are used to evaluate whether a screen is positive or negative. Then the assessment of the evaluator's findings. And finally, the consistency of the things that were found during the physical, psychological, or both evaluation and the experiences des described by the client. Does the client's story fit with what you found in your evaluation? So here's an example of the physical examination. So again, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, general vital signs, skull, hair, scalp, eyes, ears, very complete, but written in language that a judge can understand, not somebody who's had years and years of medical training. And finally, here's an example of a psychological evaluation. So methods of assessment. I used a depression screen called PHQ-9. I used a generalized anxiety screen called such and such. Um, I used a post-traumatic stress disorder um, screen called PHQ-15. Um, and then the results of these specific questionnaires, and it says this instrument scores depression from zero to 20, or 27, um, and this uh, patient, this client filled it out um, and had this score, which we would evaluate as positive or negative. Now, screening is usually done um, before a visit in the outpatient setting because we want to know if we want to talk about this during the visit. But I have found these screens to be much more valuable if you do them at the end of the evaluation. In other words, you've developed a relationship with this person, you've heard their story, and then you say, we would kind of like to measure some of your symptoms on the ruler of a screen. Whereas I think if you give it to the client before the, the evaluation, they don't know what you're looking for and they may overrepresent or underrepresent by trying to psych you out and figure out what you're actually looking for. One thing I've actually found helpful in screens as well is to have the client do the screen in the present time, but also do the screen as though it were the worst time during their negative experiences, the things that caused them to, to leave their home. And what that helps you do is to say, at the very worst time, this screen, according to the client's memory, shows these symptoms at this severity. If we now compare it to this situation, we can find that these symptoms are completely gone are somewhat resolved or still very present. And it gives us two points in time to say what's going on and also to surmise what would happen if we took somebody who's doing much better now and sent them back to the setting um, in which they um, had a lot of trouble. So a couple of back best practices about writing an affidavit. Use headings to organize your narrative use paragraphs with numbers or letters to lead from one event to the next, and refer to your client either by name, and I would use Ms. or Mr. or whatever the client prefers, um, or applicant, not victim, survivor, patient. Um, you want to keep this in legal terms, um, which is really tough for medical people. You've seen I've already slipped a couple times by calling people patient. You want to try to be objective and impartial. You are not the physician or the mental health professional of this, of this client. Um, you are being asked to evaluate professionally the story, the symptoms, and an assessment. Um, so you want to stick to the facts um, and not exaggerate or surmise. Um, and so you want to say, he states, she describes, they report. Um, 
it is fine to describe high emotions, but they should be emotions coming from the patient, so uh, from the client. So for example, if your client begins to discuss a very traumatic or painful situation and begins to weep, that's a very important thing to put into the, into the um, description. So as she began to discuss the way her husband had treated her while she was pregnant, she began to cry uncontrollably. And we had to stop for several minutes. Or as he began to describe being, being beaten um, with a bully stick, his voice became very quiet and he began to shake. So describing the story and the emotions that are surrounding it can be very helpful in terms of trying to understand whether what you're hearing is genuine um, or maybe exaggerated or under described. Um, so you don't wanna overinterpret findings. You wanna describe what you see. But if you feel there's more under the surface, it's fine to continue to go. Now, this is really different from medical care because in medical care, we usually don't pursue trauma or bad stories past the point where a patient is willing to talk about them. But the whole point of an affidavit is to find out the worst stuff that's happened to people and to put that into a written form, which is very difficult if you're just meeting this person for the first time and you're not their doctor, you are their evaluator. So, it's important to start before the evaluation of explaining that this could be very difficult and I will try to be very respectful. If you need to take time, that's fine. And also that um, some of these things may feel very difficult to talk to or painful or shameful. We see it as a strength if you're able to remember these things and speak about them and we will not judge you for them. In fact, we think you're incredibly strong to have made it here today to do this uh, conversation. Um, now, the simple listening to a person's story can often be very therapeutic, and in my experience, most people are quite relieved to have gotten through this process, not only because they're finished with giving their statement to a well-educated person, often whom they're afraid of, um, but also because they realize that you've listened to the story and you haven't judged them. And oftentimes, many people haven't talked about some of these details ever since they haven't because they are very shameful and frightening. And oftentimes people feel back in the setting when they talk about them. So people often feel quite unburdened by telling these stories. Well, doing all that in a certain way, you are offering the treatment of listening um, respectfully, but you are not an advocate for this client. You are able at the end of the um, evaluation to make suggestions and recommendations for treatment to the judge, but that isn't the primary purpose that you're here for. So when you write the affidavit, unnecessary details are not important. Numbers and dates are important if specifically they refer to times or signposts in a history, um, but you don't need to go into sidebars on things that don't have to do with the, um, with the um, root of the patient's, of the client's life. Um, it is helpful to include um, significant quotations about alleged abuse, um, and also uh, physical and psychological responses. Um, try to be clear, try to be concise, try to use the client's own words. So what should you leave out? Well, anything that's not relevant to the clinical findings. Um, so if, if other stories go on and somebody begins to talk about what happened to a friend and gets into details about that, um, it may be helpful to mention that the client talked about friends going through comparable situations, but it's not necessary to get into the details of what actually happened to the friend. Um, the same thing with other family members, only if it's relevant to the story you're presenting of this particular client. Try really hard not to use medical jargon. Um, if you feel a medical word is important, um, then it's important to include a lay language explanation or start with the lay language explanation and follow it with parentheses as in medicine, we would describe this as healing by secondary intention, for example. You are also not making legal conclusions with loaded words like persecution or well-founded fear. Um, and your opinions are, uh, your clinical expertise is 
important for things that you are qualified to speak about, but avoid things that you're not clinically qualified to speak about. So for example, um, if you're asked to discuss uh, the surgical repair of a wound and you don't feel that's something you're qualified to do, you can remark on how the wound looks as a scarred wound, but you can't talk about whether it was appropriately closed. And again, anything that you wouldn't feel comfortable dependent, defending under oath during cross-examination. Remember, lying under oath is its own legal problem. So what do we do once we get all this information? We have our medical students and evaluators um, uh, contributing together to build this document. So the medical students will be two medical students generally attending the evaluation, transcribing the interview in real time. And it's really like watching a stenographer in a court. And the idea is that you have two people who are commenting on what's going on. I admit that I also take notes. When I have a lot of information given to me by a lawyer, I will sometimes create um, in landscape view, often with an extra piece of paper um, glued on to, to the right, um, the questions that I want to be sure that I ask or things that I hear about or investigate a little bit more with my questioning. And sometimes I will make extra comments on the side, which forms a third source of information for putting the story together. And if I notice emotional responses, um, voice, body language, um, tears, quiet, et cetera, I'll comment about them in my notes so that I can, again, bring those into the story. Um, we're putting together three people's memories. And um, so um, the evaluator adds that initial point about uh, their, their professional training um, and then um, uh, screening tools or physical exam um, and then an assessment. What do you think you found as diagnoses for this? client and your impressions of that. Um, for example, I believe this is a uh, woman suffering from uh, depression. Um, in fact, I believe this is severe depression and would fall under the diagnosis of major depressive disorder because it's been going on for this long and it's this severe. Again, your conclusions, um, which means uh, not only did you find these diagnoses, but you are also um, Describing the consistency with which what you think you found uh, dovetails with what you heard from the client or found on the physical exam, and that it feels um, uh, consistent, that the story feels consistent with what the client has described, or the story does not feel consistent with what the client describes. For example, somebody who seems to be spewing out a memorized story without any emotions, no, everything seems to be exactly what you read in this document with no changes at all. Generally, things will modify a little bit if they're, if they're accurate uh, because you're a different person hearing the story and because you're a medical professional eliciting the story, which is really different from a legal professional eliciting that. Um, you may also make recommendations. Um, not, I think I should see this client in my clinic on Monday morning at nine o'clock, but um, this uh, man is still suffering um, from severe uh, traumatic uh, memories and would uh, profit from having treatment with a mental health professional experienced in dealing with trauma or um, this uh, client continues to have a bullet uh, lodged in his uh, near his ribs which bothers him continuously and it would be helpful to have uh, a surgical evaluation to see if that can be taken care of that kind of thing um, and then you are not required to take the medical student uh, narrative hook line and sinker you work together if there are um, inconsistencies of memories, you try to put those things together. And even though it's a very long day, these often will take about four hours apiece, believe it or not, it's super helpful if the draft can be written on this, within 24 hours or even before the sun sets because the memory begins to fade and particularly the chronology of when you saw somebody behaving a certain way. So as much as you can hammer it out um, as soon as possible, that's incredibly helpful to the process. So preparing an affidavit, um, how do you start to write? So obviously you begin your notes and you begin your draft and um, you know, use templates and instructions that are in the Istanbul protocol um, about how to examine asylum seekers and also samples from PHR and BRAC. In fact, if you're an evaluator, it may help you to bring one of those documents stretched out with room for notes so that you're actually conducting your 
evaluation along the lines of what you're hoping to write up. So you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, once you've gotten, um, or, you know, and it's fine to ask experienced evaluators to share a document with you to empty out their text and to put your own in related to the story that you have. Again, um, this isn't poetry or short story uh, contest. We're not looking for, not talking about plagiarism, we're talking about the clear delivery of a piece of information to a judge. So you want to send your draft to the attorney and await comments and they will come. Uh, you finalize this with the attorney, have them, uh, you offer them a signed copy um, along with a copy of your uh, CV or resume uh, highlighted with your relevant experience. And then we also send a copy to BRAC um, to keep in their um, library as examples. So um, how do you evaluate the consistency of what a client is telling you and also the story you're hearing? So um, first of all, um, ask yourself, are the symptoms that I'm hearing about and the clinical observations that I'm making consistent with the alleged experiences? So if a person is describing being beaten, we would, and they say that there are scars left on their body, we would expect to do a thorough examination of the skin. Um, and um, we would expect to find scars related to that trauma but also scars related to other experiences in life, like you know, a kitchen cut, a burn from filling hot water on yourself as a young child, and also some uh, scars that people can't explain. I, I know I've had that for years, but I can't remember how I got it. Okay, we all have scars like that. If somebody says, for example, every scar in their body is related to this particular trauma, that would be odd, okay? Um, Oftentimes, sadly, uh, it's getting easier and easier. Torturers are finding more and more ways to cause great harm and pain to people and leaving no scars. So just because you don't find scars doesn't mean um, the person didn't go through the experience they described. Uh, we had a young woman who had been through a lot of trauma uh, at the hands of an aunt. Um, and she said, but I only have one scar related to all the beatings when the aunt had uh, whipped her with an electrical cord and she had a small sort of lemon shaped scar on the side of her leg. And when we did an exam, we found that scar that was specifically where she said, and we found other scars, but she said, no, those weren't related to her aunt. So are psychological findings typical of what you'd expect for somebody who went through extreme stress um, within the cultural and social context? So oftentimes people will not discuss what they found um, in uh, what they've experienced in their torture um, because it's shameful. For example, a woman who's been uh, molested sexually or a man who's been um, uh, molested sexually um, by another man. These are things that are so shameful that people will not discuss them in their own uh, cultures. Um, and so part of what you can do is to say, um, I understand this would be very shameful in your culture, I am not in any way judging you for this. I consider this to be something that happened to you rather than because you brought it on or because it's changed you or scarred you in terms of how I respect you. Um, so, and two people who go through the identical situation may have very different reactions to it based on their own psychological well being, other things that have happened in their life, whether there was previous trauma or not. Um, and given the fluctuating course of trauma related mental illnesses, you have good days and bad days, um, it can sometimes be hard to figure out just how impaired somebody was when they were living with an abuser and now are free of it or when they were living in a dangerous situation and now are in a safer one. So when you evaluate consistency, you ask, you know, what are coexisting stressors and impact? For example, is this person in prison? Are they in a situation where there's been one event or it's an ongoing event? The gangs still keep coming back. Um, have they been forced to leave home? What did they leave behind? Was that a, a relief? Was that painful? What has exile been like? How were they joining long lost family members? And so that's been a positive or are they more lonely? So that's been a negative. Um, what happened when they were no longer the mother of the family they had to leave because they were um, in danger of their life um, by a violent husband. Um, and what happened, you know, in terms of their social role? Because most people have been in very 
ancient social relationships in the towns and villages they come from. And so suddenly being cast um, alone in the United States can be, can be quite its own version of trauma. And finally, do the, you know, do the physical conditions seem to contribute to the clinical picture? Does somebody have a lot of memory issues because they, they sustained a, a bad head injury, either as some other part of their life or because that was part of what was done to them? Um, and finally, does the clinical picture suggest that somebody's making this up? And those are the hardest ones because you, you get together, you have your whole team, you're you know, gearing up to hear something really painful. And as it comes out, you sort of like, Something doesn't add up here. This person seems not invested in this story, but invested in the outcome of this evaluation. That doesn't mean people aren't giggling inappropriately or um, not showing the full emotions you'd expect in a situation, because those are protective mechanisms. But if somebody just rattles off the words that you think will, should appear in an affidavit and you're feeling the sense of falseness, dig a little deeper and it's okay to say, I did not find the story consistent with the level of trauma this person described. So final thoughts, um, you know, expect edits from your attorney and communicate, you know, use the resources, sample affidavits, checklists, feedback, mentors, um, do not reinvent the wheel. It may turn out to be less effective than a wheel that's already there. And an affidavit is only as good as the evaluation on which it's based. So do take the time. Um, I've never had to do this, but um, if you feel like you missed something important, like as you really think about it, I really should have asked about that situation. And I forgot. It's possible to communicate with somebody, you know, through another meeting, over Skype, from the, through the, uh, the lawyer's office. So if you feel you missed something important and you should have checked something, just like a medical situation, you can go back and add to the information that you gathered. Um, and if you have any questions, reach out to the BRAC board um, or if you need additional examples. Um, likewise, if you'd like somebody experienced to read your testimony to see, or, or your affidavit to see if it, um, what would make it stronger, that's a totally reasonable thing to ask for a mentor within the group. So what if you have to testify? Scary, scary, scary. Um, it's actually pretty rare. Uh, I have been asked to testify twice. One of the cases was settled without that, and the other one I was asked to come last June, a year ago. A year ago, I was asked to come this past June, and when this past June arrived because COVID was in full swing, um, it was put off again, so I still have never made it there. Um, so when it's necessary, it can be super helpful, and it's actually a very good skill to develop. Um, in my experience, having been to court for a few other things related to patients, um, judges are totally blown away when a doctor or mental health professional leaves their busy life to show up in the judge's courtroom. And they tend to be very respectful of time, of your credentials, and very uh, touched that you actually show up. And it means a lot if you cared enough about this patient to come the distance either by Skype or in person. Um, it's also cool. I mean, you put a lot of work into this. You know, if you show up and polish that final part of it, it can be very powerful. Um, and you gain in, in, insight into whether forensic expert witnessing is for you. Um, and um, it's, you'll understand a little bit better what the legal process is and how careful or terse these judges are and how much it depends on the specific judge that a client gets as to how the outcome sometimes goes. Um, and it's also important to watch the client and you are a familiar face to the client. So if there's a second person knowing the person and bolstering them there, that can actually be super helpful to them because this is absolutely terrifying to the client. I mean, so much is riding on this. So um, immigration court is unfamiliar to most of us. Um, it's helpful to prepare, and that is the responsibility of the lawyer with whom you're working. Um, this can be done on the phone, but you should say, you know, what kind of direct questions are they going to ask you? Like they'll ask you about your credentials, but they'll ask you, um, you know, in your affidavit, you said such and such. Um, did you mean that this happened? Um, so questions that are honed in, but also cross-examination type questions like you've seen on TV and in the movies where they keep, uh, the questioner keeps driving farther and farther down the line of questioning, sometimes in an effort to understand something better, 
sometimes in an effort to find inconsistencies in what you're saying. So um, you are gonna be pushed to the point of uncertainty. That's part of the process of cross-examination. And so it's really important to say, to be able to say, I don't know. I didn't ask about that. I'm not sure. You know, for example, is it normal in that culture for such and such to happen? If that's not something you investigated or know about, you can say, I don't know. Um, so always be honest. Um, so you will, in order to prepare, you wanna review your report and also the consistency of the findings and the allegations to make sure that you can link those two things because that is the crux of the matter. Um, and you should be able to explain, ready to explain inconsistencies. When your client talked to the lawyer, she said that she had three sisters, but when you talked to her, she had four. Can you explain that? And you say, yes, her mother was married twice and she has a stepsister, but she doesn't have a very good relationship with this person who lives far away. And so she really doesn't think of the, as one of her sisters. Um, explain the likely causes of physical injury and psychological injury. Um, and sometimes people will claim to have self-inflicted wounds and that can be really tough because did this person actually hurt themselves in order to seek asylum? And of course those things do happen, but self-inflicted wounds um, are pretty common in humanity. Um, just think of the, of the teen who cuts, right? or um, just think of somebody who may have gotten lots and lots of tattoos at a confusing period or piercings at a confusing period of their life. Um, people will often hurt themselves while they're being hurt. For example, um, biting themselves while being raped to avoid crying out or screaming and waking a baby for fear that the baby might wake up or to uh, avoid seeming weaker because that might actually bring more harm to them. So you'll find wounds on people that were self-inflicted um, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, and that doesn't mean somebody's crazy, and it doesn't mean they're lying, and it doesn't mean that they faked them in order to get asylum. Um, so if you feel that somebody has not been honest and is malingering, that is one of the most heartbreaking situations to find yourself in because it means your client will likely be deported, um, but it's an important thing. You were asked to testify to evaluate this person for the consistency of findings and the allegations by the, by the uh, client. And so if you truly believe that this doesn't hold together the story, it's important to be honest. Um, and um, it's helpful to say, I'm following the rules of the Istanbul protocol. And if you can have like an elevator pitch for what the Istanbul protocol is and how you're organizing this around um, findings of consistency. So a couple of good practices for testimony, be honest and truthful. Um, don't distort, don't misrepresent, don't exaggerate. Um, if you have a lot of sort of bad things and one really bad thing, it may be helpful to try and avoid the exaggerated language for the first thing so that when you speak about the, the most important thing that you're, uh, you will sound um, believable. Um, you want to let people know all the sources of information. So for example, if you went back and read about the history of a conflict that you want to know a little bit more, you can say, well, I, I found this very strange that people were being hurt that way. But when I went back to talk about what had happened um, you know, in Eritrea or in the Congo, I found that this was a very common form of injury. Um, we are well-educated people. We like to talk. We like to hear our own voices. But in the courtroom, less is more because anytime you say too much, you open yourself up to another line of direct or cross-examination questioning. Um, speak, if they wanna know more, they can ask you another question. Speak clearly and slowly and make eye contact. Again, um, you are trying to connect with the judge who's weighing the odds and is now in the room with somebody as well educated as they are. And so it can be very helpful to professional, professional, this is my conviction about what happened. Um, so you wanna be assertive and confident, but not cocky and obnoxious, not pushy, but direct, okay? Presenting what you know. 
Um, it's okay to say I need to refer to that. I can't remember the order in which those two things happen, for example. Avoid your medical jargon. If you want to use a medical word, translate it into English. And give descriptions that illuminate but don't oversimplify. So for example, um, if you're describing a wound, um, I would say it's approximately the size of a saucer. Um, and it had maybe 16 different sections coming out, almost like star, like rays on a star. Um, there were parts that had healed well. There were parts that had wide scars suggesting that they had healed slowly over time. And there was one area of the wound that was um, deep. Uh, and the, the client said there had been an infection in that part of the wound before it healed. That was consistent with the description of how he was cut with that knife and um, that the knife had been, had come out of a barn um, where there were cows, something like that. Um, when you don't know an answer, say no. I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know. You don't need to apologize. I don't know. I don't remember. I didn't ask. That's fine. When you get defensive, you seem less credible. But if you confidently say, I don't know, I didn't ask that, that's fine. So in terms of direct examination, questions that are clear directions, um, it gives you an opportunity to state the most important parts of your report. Um, your attorney should help you do that. Your client's attorney should help you do that. And the questions are um, offered to provide you an opportunity to address your evaluation. So your attorney may be asking those questions in order to have you create the story as you found it um, in a logical way. How about cross-examination? Um, you're gonna be challenged about your credentials. Well, uh, Dr. Toll, you've only been doing, you know, affidavit evaluations for a year. Uh, why should I believe this report is credible? Judge, I've only been doing these evaluations for a year, but I have been working with refugees for 10 years and many of the same forces that cause people to become asylees um, cause people to become refugees. So I feel like I have a lot of experience with that. Moreover, my career has of 25 years practicing medicine has involved approximately half my patients being immigrants so uh, from all over the world. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about the forces and diseases of uh, people who come from different parts of the world and have experienced immigration. So, so it's possible to say, your may not be experienced in this way, but other experience has made it relevant to yourself. Um, if somebody doesn't think you're, if somebody challenges you, you can agree with them, but then refute it because of some other piece of relevant information that supports your qualifications. Try not to take it personally. It's a rattling experience. I hear, unfortunately, well, I've been through it once um, uh, on behalf of a patient. Um, try not to panic. Try not to be defensive. Try not to get angry. Um, but um, some challenges may not be based in good medicine and forensics um, and try to correct you, the record if necessary. So for example, I have two medical students and an interpreter um, and potentially a, an observer in the room when I'm doing the interview. But if I'm doing a medical exam, I may only have one medical student there to be taking notes and perhaps drawing diagrams on, a, uh, you know, on an outline of a person. Because I don't think that that private um, evaluation needs to have that whole room full of people. Well, doctor, you know, you had all these people remembering for you while you were in the room doing the, the evaluation, but um, you seem only to have had one medical student with a piece of paper. Why should I believe that what you found is what was actually there? And of course, you can take photographs and bring pictures as well. So tips and final thoughts. Um, listen carefully to the words of, your, of the questions that are being asked. If you don't understand a question, ask for clarification. If there's time to, degree, to disagree, particularly based on your professional perspective, do so politely but with conviction. And caution, caution about those uh, phrases that can get you into a corner. Wouldn't you agree that? Isn't it true that, isn't it true that this uh, young man hadn't been doing very well in school when he decided to leave? Do you think maybe he, it was really about school and that there weren't any gangs, okay? 
or would you say that most people who go through this don't have scars, but this client does have a scar? Or wouldn't you say that most people who have been, um, you know, pistol whipped with the handle of a pistol would have at least some dents in their head, but you say this client doesn't have any. And so don't let people sit, put words in your mouth. This is your testimony. This is your client. This is your affidavit. So it's incredibly helpful to prepare with an attorney. It's much easier to testify if you've had a practice run um, and a, a rehearsal. Um, you know more about this client in relationship to what you learned in your evaluation than anybody else. Um, and you are there to help the judge make an important decision. And it's incredibly meaningful, as I mentioned. Um, judges have a lot of respect for professionals who show up in their courtrooms, and they generally treat them extremely well. So if you really believe, I mean, the judge is only meeting this person sometimes for the first time and making this life-altering and potentially fatal decision for a, for a client. So your four hours spent with this person really trying to assess their story and the veracity of their story is incredibly valuable to the judge. So assume that the judge is going to value your presence and is going to actually think a lot about what you say in terms of making a decision. So um, these are also valuable professional skills to have. Um, it helps you explain things to, uh, to people who are not in your field. Um, it helps you discuss difficult things in respectful ways. Um, and it helps you support uh, a client in a way um, that could be incredibly valuable to them. And remember, now that we've made it so exciting to do, it's very rare that it happens. So um, we have a few more minutes. Um, and I want to go into some excerpts from uh, sample affidavits. Um, and um, it may be helpful to actually take a picture of these if you're working on them to see how you might rewrite these in better language. So let me go through a few and uh, point out some things that I might, uh, that I think are particularly well written or that I think might be better changed to be a little more streamlined. Mrs. N was cooperative during her interview. Um, she speaks very little English, so French was used for this evaluation. Her speech is somewhat monotonous. There was no psychomotor agitation or retardation noted. Her speech was somewhat slow, but it could be due to the fact that French was not her native language, even though she's quite fluent in it. Otherwise, her speech was mostly goal-directed and logical. Her mood is mostly dysphoric. Her affect lay uh, flat, no layability was noted. Mood and affect were compatible. She became somewhat teary at some points in the interview, which is consistent with the delicate nature of this assessment. So um, I think there's a lot of information here, but I think it could be reorganized to be more helpful. Um, I don't love the word cooperative, but it's often used to say um, we felt that this client was participating well um, thoroughly during this interview. There's the issue of language, which I think is important. She speaks little language. So French was used in this evaluation, and she is quite fluent in French, although it is not her first language. Okay, um, so you put all the language information there. Then we go on to psychomotor agitation or retardation. Then we're hearing about her the slowness of her speech, but could it be because she's not speaking her native language, but she's fluent in it? Otherwise, her speech was mostly goal-directed and logical. So part of this is describing her history of languages, and part of this is actually a psychological ex assessment of her speech. So I would separate it out as I did first describing the language, and then using putting the speech together as one of the psychological assessment tools. Her speech was somewhat monotone, but logical and goal-directed. So that's everything we noticed about her speech, right? Then there was no psychomotor agitation or retardation noted. That is not a speech quality. That's an emotional or physical quality. So we can bring that next. And then her mood is mostly dysphoric, but we was we were using was before, so I'd keep them in the same tense. Her mood was mostly dysphoric and her affect flat, no liability was noted. 
That's a lot of medical words for a judge. So she seemed to be rather sad without a lot of emotional change, a bit flat, and no liability was noticed. We, we did not see rapid changes in emotion. It's probably easier for a judge to understand than liability. The emotions she showed and the emotions we saw seemed consistent or compatible. She did become somewhat tearful at times during the interview, which dovetailed or went alongside the material being discussed at those times. So organize it in a logical way, put the psychological details that are relevant together and try to avoid medical jargon. Sample two, based upon my knowledge of tortures and their psychological effects and an understanding of the political climate in Angola, the violation of human rights of women in its history is my judgment that Ms. N's allegations are highly consistent with and supported by the historical and psychological facts presented above. Oh, how I wish I could be talking to you all directly. Um, but I think it's neat that this uh, evaluator went back to learn something about Angola or maybe even knew something about Angola. Um, and that's one kind of history. But we're also talking about the narrative history that this, this client delivered. And I think it's getting confusing to talk about the Angolan history and the history of the client and the psychological facts. So um, I think it's not helpful to describe the political climate in Angola unless you're making a specific text. Uh, machete attacks on civilians by other civilians were extremely common during the civil war in Angola, if you find that helpful. And this client seemed to have been caught up in those forces. We know from that kind of torture, both physical and seeing one's family go through it and the psychological effects of that, it is my judgment that the allegations of this client are highly consistent with and supported by the, by the narrative she gave and the psychological facts that we presented about. Okay. When we get into the political climate in Angola and the violation of human rights in history and all this kind of stuff like that, what are they actually referring to? Was she raped? Then use the word rape. Did she see extreme violence with machetes? Then describe that. So I think if you're bringing a kind of torture that was very common during a specific conflict, it is reasonable to bring that in. And therefore, what we've been able to learn from people who've gone through that kind of experience. But we don't really want to get into the history of all violations of everybody everywhere, unless it's relevant to what's going on. So I think it's helpful to say specific aspects if they relate to the case. Number three, I find Ms. W's story to be credible and consistent with all the information provided to me. Boom, OK, that's so clear either as the first sentence or the last sentence, okay? Her psychiatric symptoms are credible sequelae to the detention and rape she describes and not a continuation of previously psychiatric problems. Okay. So her psychiatric symptoms are credible sequelae. Sequelae is probably a medical word, eh? So it's her psychiatric symptoms um, are credible follow-ups the tension and rape she describes, and most like, and not a continuation of previous psychiatric problems. So she may have gone through some bad stuff before, but this is a whole other level. <coughs> Ms. W meets diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'd probably put according to DSM-5. Her current presentation is also typical for someone who has endured similar traumatic experiences and that the comorbidity between a mood disorder and PTSD is quite common. Her symptoms are likely to remain, although they're likely to fluctuate over time without treatment. So I think it's very strong, the first two sentences and the diagnosis. Um, I would probably have put her major depressive disorder and post traumatic which often occur together. Could have gone in that sentence rather than Comorbidity between mood disorder and that is, it gets a little off. 
Um, so I think it would have been stronger just to tack that on to the end of those diagnoses. Her current presentation is also typical for someone who has endured similar traumatic experiences, period. They often show a combination of depression and trauma. That's another way you can do that. Um, and her symptoms are likely to remain, although likely to fluctuate over time without treatment. It would be my recommendation that she be referred to a therapist with extensive experience dealing with um, detention and rape. Oh, and I also think in this past one, a little bit of uh, grammar, for example, um, and not a continuation of previously psychiatric problems, previous psychiatric problems. So if you're somebody who had struggles with writing or struggles with grammar, have somebody else read it just to clean up the language a little bit if, you're, if you don't feel confident in those areas. Number four, a very critical feature of the clinical picture is the degree of Ms. Um, psychogenic amnesia that is her inability to recall so many aspects of her traumatic experiences or related to those experiences. Two underlying factors may help us understand this. Sometimes her fear was so intense that she was unable to pay attention to things happening around her. In such a situation, the details would not even have registered. But another factor underlying this amnesia is her reliance on the psychological defense mechanisms of depression, suppression, and denial to protect herself against severe pain and conflict which results in inconsistencies. Some of the details in her telling of the history that are likely to occur as thoughts and feelings about painful infant, on and on and on. What is important to note is that the major themes of the history provided are consistent. So I think, again, it's, you're seeing the way the evaluator is thinking, but I think it could be cl cleared up a little bit. Um, a critical feature of this client's picture is her inability to recall many aspects of her traumatic experiences. Um, it is important to understand that this is very common for two reasons. Sometimes fear is so intense that people can't pay attention while it's being, while the scary things are happening. And so a person like that might not even have registered details to remember them. And another possibility is that the trauma was so severe that she repressed some of it or denies some of it as a way of protecting herself against extreme pain. Clients who do this will often show inconsistencies in stories. So again, I would try to make it, instead of like rattling off all the depression, the defenses that are there, I would try to make it um, a teaching opportunity for the judge. And I do think what is important, these factors, however, do not change my assessment that her story is consistent with her diagnoses um, and uh, credible. So BRAC has a bunch of writing guides and templates um, that you can download. Uh, and here are some more uh, resources, um, questionnaires that are, uh, the group has in uh, English and Spanish. And you would want a client to fill that out by themselves uh, unless they're illiterate um, or unless it's a language that they don't speak so that you're not influencing the results. Um, and then we would present the judge with the original versions in Spanish and then also translated versions. Um, a reading list here and some uh, examples of affidavit templates.